morning, everybody. Welcome again. Thanks so much for spending some of your weekend here with us at Connect Church. My name is Joel, and I'm one of the pastors around here. And I get the privilege of closing out our fake news series. We've been spending three weeks talking about fake news. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was a kid, when I was about, uh, I think I was about 12 years old, I, uh, I really wanted to watch this one horror movie. Um, with my friend Calvin, and uh, so I asked my parents. I was, I feel like I, I was probably kind of young in the big scheme of things to watch this particular movie, um, but uh, I asked my parents if I could watch it, and and my dad says yes, but but it was something that I needed to know, is that it was true, and I was like, what? He's like, oh no, like this this movie, like everything that's happened was true. Now, um, if you're familiar with kind of right around the year 2000, early 2000, there was a bunch of those horror movies that came out like the kind of handy cam styles. So it kind of looked like someone was like filming the movie and it's like super shaky and super sketchy all the time. So my dad actually convinced me that this particular horror movie was true, like was, was real, like this was actual footage that these people went out and got. And so we sat down to watch this movie and we started watching it. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what the movie was, but, uh, but it was ridiculous. It was a very silly movie. But about halfway through, we paused the movie, me and my friend Calvin, shaking. Like our whole bodies. Because my dad had us so convinced that this movie was true. We came downstairs and we were like freaking out and just losing it. And my dad like kind of realizing the, the mistake, <laughs> the mistake that he might have made there or whatever. He was like, oh, no, 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 you don't have to worry. It's not true. It's not true. And it was funny because after that he, he convinced us like, oh, no, this is just a movie. And we had to like look it up and there's a director and everything because we were like so freaked out, so messed up. And we still, we ended up finishing the movie, I think. But, uh, but, it, but we were still like so freaked out. And I remember just thinking to myself, man, I was so gullible. Like I got so duped or so like, you mean so messed up that he, that he was able to convince me that this ridiculous Hollywood movie was true. I don't know if, you're ever, if you've ever been duped like that or if you're gullible in the room. I don't know if you had heard, but if you say gullible really, really slowly, it, it sounds like orange. Have you ever heard that? You see what I did there? You see what I did there? That's good. I don't know if you've ever been duped, but, but that's, <laughs> that's good. That's good. You like that. That's good. I don't know about you, but that's the thing with fake news. Is sometimes it, it catches us. Sometimes it dupes us. Sometimes it twists things just enough. Maybe, maybe you've sort of bought into a, a lie or somebody, maybe you've had a circumstance like that where someone has convinced you something that just wasn't true and you went on sort of believing that true thing, or that not true thing. Like I said, I get the privilege of closing out our fake news teaching series. It's been kind of a fun little three-parter. First, we spent the first week talking about individualism, and, uh, which is basically the idea that it's all about me. And I, and I challenged us, I spoke that message, and I challenged us that what if we got past ourselves and ate together? What if, we, what if we had a little bit more of a community mindset and just didn't think about ourselves all of the time? And then last week, uh, Frank spoke a message on consumerism, which is just this need to incessantly buy more and buy more and buy more. And Frank had this awesome message on God and money or God and mammon. Now, if you missed those messages, I encourage you to head to YouTube and check them out uh, Frank's main encouragement last week was to pray before you pay. So to spend some time with God before you just make purchases all of the time. And this week, just a nice little softball, just closing it out on a high note, we're going to talk about materialism. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> which, uh, which, is the, which is the idea that it is the stuff in our life that makes us happy. The stuff, the things, the material possessions. You know, just some nice, easy topics for this three-week teaching series. Not really. It's actually been quite hard. May, hard for some of us because we've found ourselves in these cultures. We've found ourselves in these ideas maybe more than we would like. Maybe for some of us, we've been duped a little bit. We've been sucked into these ideas without even really thinking about it. Today, our fake news headline for this series is, Studies Show You Can Take It With You. Studies show you can take it with you when you die. Which we know is ridiculous, and yet, at times, we live like it's the truth. 
For so many of our lives, for so many of us, our lives are marked with the accumulation of stuff, with junk. You see, we feel lousy or we feel bored or we feel unfulfilled and we go to the altar of Walmart and we give our little bits of gold for an item that we hope will satisfy us. Maybe this will make me happy. Or we hop online and we shop. Amazon Prime, baby, right? Like, like seriously, like we can feel terrible and it's like, oh, I could just, if I just got that thing on Amazon Prime, I have all those things sitting in my shopping cart right now. I could just, even one of them would just be so much better. Are you with me? No? You have to raise your hand. It's okay. <laughs> Did you hear that Amazon is actually rolling out Amazon Now? In major cities. It's actually in a bunch of major cities throughout the US, and and I know that I've heard that they're planning on moving that into Canada as well. Basically, Amazon now promises delivery in two hours. In LA, actually, like as a part of the, the launch, they were actually saying that they could get it there in one hour. Here was the billboard that was in LA for Amazon now, or sorry, Amazon Prime now. Zero to happy in one hour. Isn't that funny? Like, just think about that for a second. Zero to happy in one hour, right? This is the culture that we're immersed in, right? This is the culture that says that, hey, if you're feeling like a zero, all you need to do is click on one item on Amazon, and in one hour, you can be happy. Like, that, if that was real news, that would be the best news. Like, that would be such good news, but we know that it's not real. We might click and purchase that thing and feel happy for 10 seconds, or for a day, or maybe for some of us a week, or for some of the items, you mean, it might, might, you mean, oh man, this would be so awesome, or whatever, and then what does it do? It just sits there on the shelf, right? And yet, this is the culture that we're immersed in, zero to happy in one hour. You see, marketers are perpetually telling us that this item, if we just bought this item, that it would make us better, that you feel terrible right now because you don't own a insert item here. I don't even want to say items there because I don't want you to even believe that anymore. But, like, but if, you, if, if you could just own this one thing, this one type of car, or this one type of watch, or this one type of dog, or I don't know, like if you could just purchase this one thing, you would feel great about yourselves. The only thing holding us back is just one small purchase away. That's all it's going to take. Check out this video for a second. We spend so much time on the hunt but nothing ever quite does it for us. And we get so wrapped up in the hunt that it kind of makes us miserable. Black Friday shopping mania is still playing out tonight at malls across America. Yeah, high hopes of saving some big bucks on those holiday gifts. To the in some cases, it did turn violent. We've, as a culture, have lost our minds. There's no question that what it means to have achieved the American dream has increased tremendously in material terms. This is not something that just happened yesterday. This is something that has been sold to us over the past hundred years by those that want to make a whole lot of money. Now that's what I call a good looking car. You have this thing that you were obsessed about, but then the new version comes out, and now you no longer care about the one you have. In fact, the one you have is a source of dissatisfaction. People are beginning to recognize that they've maybe been tricked. There is no out until you become aware. You're not gonna get happier by consuming more. So that's a little clip from uh, the trailer for a documentary called Minimalism which is on Netflix, maybe you've checked it out. Um, if you have it, I would recommend it. It is very, very interesting. The interesting thing about that is the creators of that and, and that the whole little spiel that you saw there at the beginning, not a Christian thing, not a, this is actually just our, our culture going like, hey, actually, even as a culture, this isn't helpful. This isn't healthy. Like, at some level, you see the people rushing in for Black Friday sales, and you go, yeah, that's probably not that good. And the thing for us, oftentimes, as Canadians, is we go, oh, yeah, but that's just America. Those Americans are crazy, right? But we also, you know, we also know that it, it's us too, right? We know that we, we just as easily can get wrapped up in stuff, in the, in, the, in the idea that we just need to consume more or that we need to put our hope in material stuff, that we need material stuff. Now, to be clear, after last week's message on consumerism or this week's on materialism, just to be clear, oh, there's a good idea, just to be clear... 
I know what you might. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now, to be clear, I know what you might be thinking. That was actually in my notes. I know what you might be thinking. Um, but we need to consume. We need, the guys in the booth are just loving that. We need, I know what you might be thinking. We need to consume. We need material stuff. We need to eat, and we need to clothe ourselves, and we need homes, and, and we need iPhones. Like, come on, Joel, seriously, we need iPhones or Androids, Adam, whatever, I don't care. But, but like, we need, like, we need our phones, right? We need stuff. But the problem isn't just with consumerism or materialism. The problem is that we put our hope. Ooh, that's another one. We put our hope, we put our faith, we put our trust, we put our fulfillment, we put all of our life in this stuff. The problem isn't with consumption, or the problem isn't necessarily just with materialism. It's compulsory consumption. It's the idea that we need the stuff. We need more. We need the items in order to feel good about, about ourselves. If not kept in check, we inadvertently, we turn to it. We long for it, these material things. We can inadvertently worship it. And it's so hard, too. It can be described that, that the way that we exist in our culture is like that of the experiment with the frog in the boiling pot. Now, I don't know if it's actually a real experiment or if it would actually even really work, but maybe you've heard the illustration before that, that if you take a frog and you put it into a pot of boiling water, the frog will jump out, right? But if you take that same frog and you put it into a pot of lukewarm water, like room temperature water, and then you slowly increase the temperature of that water, it will boil the frog alive before he realizes it. And that's the reality of the culture that we are so immersed in. For many of us, we're like that frog sitting in the water in the temperature of consumerism, the temperature of individualism, the temperature of this idea of materialism is just getting turned up and up and up and up, and some of us don't even realize it. Now, in the spirit of fake news, I thought, hey, I should take materialism, I should put it into Google, I should hit search, and I should click news. Like, let's see what articles are getting written about materialism right now. And actually, the very first article that popped up on my browser was actually from a, uh, um, uh, a blog, a, a, a website in the UK, um, which actually had all the contributors were written by uh, co un university professors, and the, the article was actually written about materialism, and the article title actually said, there's no shame in, mat in being materialistic, it could benefit society. So I was like, wow, that would be great news, right? Like, let's, let's look, so I, so I read the article and I read through it, and basically the idea was that actually materialism is terrible. It's, ter it's terrible for us as a cultural, it, culture, it's terrible for us as people, but they were basically sort of trying to say that, hey, materialism isn't really going anywhere, so what if we just tried to, like, help people, like, if they're going to be buying stuff all the time, let's just try to get them to buy, like, better stuff right, like Tom shoes or something like that. At least then they're buying a pair of shoes and then another pair of shoes are getting shipped to somebody who needs it, right? Like, let's just help people, like, buy more ethically. Let's, let's help people buy more things, just better things. But I was thinking about the rationale of that article and I was thinking about, I was like, what if we, maybe just for the interest of, of discussion, what if we just said, what about, like, murder? So let's, let's say, okay, so let's write the article. Let's try and write the article. Let's say, okay, we, do we think mur murder is a bad thing? Everybody? You with me? Okay, good. good. We have to sell that. If you don't, come talk to me after. But, if, if, but let's, let's say murder is a bad thing. Basically, the logic that this article was employing was just saying, hey, people aren't going to stop murdering people. It's always going to happen. Let's just help them like, try to like, murder people in like, a better way. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, hey, this thing might be evil. It might be wrong. It might be terrible. But let's like, figure out like, better ways that it could happen, more healthy ways that people could murder other people. Now, you, you might be sitting there going like, that's so ridiculous, and I know it is. It's a ridiculous illustration, but, but it's, the, it's that same logic, right? And, and the thought that I had is I'm like, at some level, I'm like, this, this is fake news. It's not fake news because it's a perspective, but the perspective is flawed, right? If materialism isn't good for us, we don't need to figure out better ways to be materialistic. We need to stop being materialistic. Are you with me? Awesome. Well, that's good. I'm glad that you are. <laughs> um, Greg Boyd, a popular author and pastor and teacher, 
um, from Minnesota actually would go so far as to say that consumerism and materialism is the greatest threat to Christianity. It's the greatest threat to the church. I heard in, heard in a message when she was talking about this um, a little bit, and he said it is absolutely the greatest threat to the church. Not anything else that you can think of, not, not uh, other perspectives or uh, other ideologies or the other ways our culture is changing or government or any of that kind of stuff. The greatest threat to, our Christi- to, to what it means for us to follow Jesus is these ideas of consumerism and materialism. So, in light of that, what I want to do is I want to ask us three questions this morning. I want to give us a few minutes just to kind of think about it. Maybe just kind of stew on it a little bit. If you want, you can turn to the person sitting next to you or you can move around a little bit to talk about it. You don't have to if you don't want. You can just think by yourself. But I want to ask us these three questions. Number one, why? Why do you think Greg Boyd thinks materialism or consumerism is the greatest threat to the church? Two, how do you see yourself getting sucked into materialism? And three, What's the last thing you bought that you never, that you never use? Cool? Just a couple nice low balls for us. Let's think about those for a couple minutes, and then we'll jump back in. So I will, um, I will respond to question number one just a little bit, because you might actually be thinking to yourself, what was Craig Boyd really thinking? What was he sort of going um, off of? And, and, and when he further explained it, basically he was explaining that same idea um, of the frog in the water principle. It's the idea that, that it's something that we can't even see coming. That, that this idea of materialism, this idea of us putting our hope and everything in stuff, in the, in the accumulation of things in our life, has the actual ability to like undermine us from the inside out. It has the ability to change us from the inside out, and we can't even see it coming. That's basically uh, the gist of his, of his idea. Uh, my personal relationship with stuff, it's <laughs> a weird way to start a sentence, um, has, has been an interesting one. Uh, Dee and I uh, moved to Cranbrook in June 2008. We had just gotten married, and we moved here in a green uh, Ford Exploder with, uh, yes, I said Exploder, um, with, uh, with the smallest U-Haul covered trailer you could possibly rent, um, and, uh, and that was it. That was our, our whole life was in that Ford Exploder and that tiny little uh, U-Haul trailer, and we moved uh, to Cranbrook from Calgary, and, uh, and then basically we started accumulating, just like everybody else does. We started getting more and more stuff until about two, two houses later. So we moved in that, in that process a couple times and we just accumulated more and more and more until we were just, in our last house, we were just up to the gills in stuff. Just, just all this stuff. And, and then it came time for us a couple of years ago when, uh, when we felt like we needed to step back for, uh, for a period of time and, and we got this ridiculous idea that we wanted to, to buy a Volkswagen van and we wanted to downsize so we started selling stuff, we started giving stuff away, we put a bunch of stuff into storage but uh, basically our whole life once again was, was just in this one little vehicle. Uh, Dee and I and our two uh, kids at the time were just in this van and I can tell you, to, I can tell you that we have never felt so free in our life. It's funny, the problem with things is that the more things we own, the more things tend to own us. Isn't it true? Between maintenance and upgrades and cleaning and upkeep, we get so wrapped up in stuff. And like I said, the problem isn't necessarily just with the stuff, but how we treat it, how we look at it and to it. And yet, the sobering reality for those of us who would say that we follow Jesus is that he had a lot to say about stuff. He had a lot to say about possessions and money. He had a lot to say about our treasure. Now, to be honest, I realize this teaching for some of us can be hard. Like I said, like the frog in the pot, we're so immersed in this culture that it it can be hard for us to wrestle with, well, what does this really look like? But we still, it's, it's an important conversation for us to be having. It's important for us to be real with some of the teachings and who Jesus really was if we're going to follow him in this 2018. The reason why is that we serve, follow, and love, and are taught by and worship Jesus, and he had a very interesting relationship with things, like he didn't really have any. Jesus was really the first minimalist, which is ridiculous. You see, he lived simply. He avoided 
stuff, material things. But he didn't just avoid it. He actually taught us to do the same. If we, if we take the concept of materialism and we expand it just a little bit to include financial giving, to include possessions, to include God's material provision over us. So if we kind of think about money and stuff and treasures and possessions, all that stuff in one conversation, um, we can actually see in the Bible that Jesus speaks about 2,000 verses in the New Testament. And out of these verses, you can count Jesus' teaching on materialism, 204 verses. Uh, if you do some quick math, which I had to do in advance because I can't do that on the, on the fly, but it's about 10%. It's basically, it was easy, but that's okay. It was about, it was about 10%. In Matthew, there's about 70 verses where Jesus is talking about materialism. In Mark, 33 verses. In Luke, 92 verses. And in John, there's three. Of the numerous passages we can look at that Jesus put things quite plainly, it's most clear for us in Matthew chapter 6, in his famous Sermon on the Mount. We'll throw it up on the screen. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Jesus challenges us with this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, or moth and rust, depending on your translation, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's a couple things that I want us to look at in this passage. I want us to kind of unpack it a little bit. First thing, at the very beginning of this passage, it says, do not store up for yourselves. Now, I've actually read in a bunch of other translations, and a bunch of scholars actually say that it actually could be probably better translated to say, stop storing up for yourselves. Now, they use the word do not, but, but basically when Jesus is teaching, he's sort of implying that he knows that they are doing it, and he's saying, don't do that, like, kind of rhetorically. Like, you can kind of, like, you can kind of jab at them a little bit. So it's the idea of, it's not just do not store at it. Jesus realized that the people he was talking to were storing up for themselves treasures on earth, as I would say that he might be speaking to us this morning. But what Jesus is actually saying is not do not store. What he's saying is stop storing up for yourselves. So we can read that again. Stop storing up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy. Basically, um, as he continues on there, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Basically, this is that, that exact idea. Jesus is challenging us to say, you can't take it with you. That this stuff, this material possessions, this accumulation of wealth and of things and of items, it doesn't matter, like, in the next life. It doesn't matter beyond, you mean, your existence right here and now. I would go so far as to say, if everything that's important to you in your life could be taken from you, could be stolen from you, could be eaten by moths or vermin, then your life is too small. Then Jesus, he offers an alternative, right? He says, don't just, don't just stop doing this. Instead, do this. He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy. So what is Jesus talking about? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What he's trying to do is give us a bigger perspective in terms of our investment. Give us a bigger perspective in terms of our life, in terms of what we spend our time doing and accumulating. Can I get two volunteers? I need help from a couple uh, people. Hey, you guys are two, and you're just sitting right there. You guys want to come help me? Sweet. Awesome. That's great. Come on up. Can you please help me welcome Scott and Ruth to the stage? So Scott, I'll get you to take this end of the paper. And, uh, and you're going to pull it, and we're going uh, to start unraveling it that way. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Keep going. Well, I, I thought this out in my head, and it was way easier. <laughs> it's like a workout. CrossFit or something. Okay, here we go. And then, Ruth, I'm going to get you to hold that end. Okay, sweet. So here's our idea this morning. Oh, look how good you guys are doing. That's great. This, this illustration for us will be, how about eternity? 
Let's make it really, really big. Now, I know if you're thinking, like, eternity, well, it hasn't started, it hasn't ended, that's ridiculous. But anyways, let's just say that it was eternity. Let's say it, like, loops in a circle or I don't know, whatever. But let's say this is eternity. And then we're going to throw a timeline on eternity, which I know that kind of is weird. But anyways, let's, let's just put a timeline on eternity. Awesome. Cool. So this is eternity. And then uh, here's your life. Can you see it? Good. Okay, so, so here's your life in all, in all of eternity. And what Jesus is giving us this picture and he's, is he's saying, hey, if you store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, what you're doing is you're taking your tiny, tiny little, I, I, I actually can't even see it myself. You're taking your tiny little speck of existence, right? Which for some of us is like, holy smokes, is it really? Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. So you're taking your tiny little speck of existence and what you're doing is you're making it even smaller, you're making the impact even less. You're basically saying, here's my little, my little speck in terms of all eternity, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to invest more in myself, which actually makes that speck even smaller and smaller and smaller because I'm only thinking about myself. What Jesus is offering us is another perspective. What he's saying is, is don't store up for yourselves treasures on, on earth where, you mean, where your impact is minimalized. He's saying, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. What he's saying is, here's you in terms of your little speck of existence. But what Jesus is offering us is the opportunity to make an impact. He's offering us the op opportunity that we don't just have to think about ourselves, but that we actually have the opportunity, even with the small decisions that we make, to actually make an eternal impact. To actually make a real impact on the world. The way of saying it is that, is that you can't take it with you when you die, but you can invest it in something that matters beyond today. So what is that? Well, that's, that's, that's following Jesus. That's investing in expanding the kingdom of God. That's investing in other people. That's living a, like living a legacy. That's, that's, that's you mean, not just thinking about yourselves all the time, but how can I love and bless others? It's sharing the love and hope and joy of Jesus with other people. When we do that stuff, we take our little speck of existence. Now, if you're struggling with speck of existence, I think in the Bible it, it uses a verse to say um, that we're like a vapor. We're here for a moment and then, and then gone. Like, that's the picture that even the scriptures give us, that little speck of existence. But what Jesus is offering us is the opportunity to make a difference in the long run. What Jesus is talking about here is not just prizes in heaven. It's not just, hey, make better choices, and I'll give you prizes when you get to heaven. What Jesus is inviting us to do is to make an impact that for some of us in this room, you, you've been longing for more to life. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, hey, it doesn't have to be about stuff. It doesn't have to be about accumulating possessions and money and, and all this stuff. It can be about so much more than that. It can be about others. It can be about sharing the love of Jesus. It can be about stuff that matters in eternity. Are you with me? Awesome. Yeah. It's great. The other way that we can look at this timeline is we can begin to look at this timeline just with our own lives. So maybe let's, let's play out this timeline a little bit. Let's reflect on this a little bit. So maybe this timeline is your day. So let's look at your day tomorrow. So what we can do is we can reflect on this passage and say, Jesus is saying, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So let's look at the hours of your day tomorrow. This is working so much, so good. I'm so stoked. Okay, so here's the hours of your day. Now, here, here's a good reflection question for us. How, mu how many of the hours of our day do we spend investing in stuff? Do we spend trying to accumulate stuff? What Jesus is offering us here is, is an, the alternate perspective, right? It doesn't need to be about stuff. It can be about things that last in eternity. It can, be, it can be storing up treasures in heaven so we can think about our day and go, man, if I'm spending all this time doing stuff that matters, you mean, not beyond myself, what does it look like for me to invest in things that matter for eternity? We can look at this with our week, you mean, with, with all the time. So you have all these things that you need to do. You need to eat, and you need to go to work, and you need to go to school, and you need to sleep, and you need to do all these things. But the thing is, if we look at the, at the graph of our life, if we look at the chart or the timeline of our life, we need to be able to ask ourselves the question, are we just still storing up for ourselves treasures on earth, or are we storing treasures 
in heaven, treasures that matter for eternity. Can you help me welcome, or help me thank uh, Scott and Ruth for helping us out? Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thanks. You see, friends, Jesus is telling us that there, there is more to life than this if we have eyes to see it. If we can walk in, if we can take steps in that direction. Then Jesus uh, shares with us in verse 21. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Which is kind of an interesting line, right? It's kind of poetic and beautiful. And it's like, oh man, what are we, what are we even doing that? What do we even do with that? And what Jesus is challenging us with is our relationship with stuff. Our relationship with where we put our treasure. Our relationship with where we invest in that stuff. Where we, where we go to. Where we find our hope and our trust and our faith and our life and our fulfillment. Where we find our purpose is where our heart is. Essentially, what Jesus is giving us is the picture of a throne. This is the throne of our lives. I know it's, it's kind of simple. It's a materialism message. I couldn't make it like big and fancy. So here's the throne of your life. Essentially what Jesus is saying is that we all have a throne in our life. And where we put our treasure, where we put our value, where we put our effort, where we find fulfillment is where our heart is. Essentially my big idea for us this morning is the, the minimalists actually have a great quote that says, love people, use things, the opposite never works. But for us this morning, um, uh, my, my quote, my, my challenge for us is, love God, use things, the opposite never works. Love God, use things, the opposite never works. The thing is, is we have a throne in our life. And for many of us, we have different things that sit on that throne. We have relationships that sit on that throne. We have stuff, material possessions that sit on that throne. We have our house on that throne. We have our car on that throne. For some of us, we might have our finances on that throne. For some of us, we might have our spouse on the throne of our lives, the thing that we find all our hope or fulfillment in. For some of us, we have our kids on the throne of our life. We have drugs on the throne. We have alcohol on the throne. We have escapism. We have the desire for experiences or holidays on the throne of our life. For some of us, we have shopping on the throne of our life. We have Starbucks on the throne of our life. We have Netflix. We have our job. We have money. Are you with me? Hear what I'm saying? We have all these things that, that can sit in the throne of our lives, the things that we turn to to find fulfillment, and that's what Jesus is speaking to here. He says, where your treasure is, where you put your hope in, is where your heart will be also. But the reality is, is those things will never deliver. That throne was not made for them. That throne doesn't even really fit them. Even for some of us in this room, maybe we've put our spouse on that throne or we've put our kids on that throne and we think, oh man, it's so good that I'm all about my spouse or I'm all about my kids. Now hear me when I say they, don't, they shouldn't be on that throne. That throne is only fit for God. It is only fit for him. He is the only one that can deliver what he has promised. Everything. And hear me when I say everything else falls short. That it is only a throne fit for God. So what? What can we do? What, how can we move past materialism in our lives? How can we live lives that aren't just the, relent, the relentless pursuit of stuff? Well, the first thing that we can do, and I'll say this as I close, the first thing that we can do is that we can invest in others. We can look beyond ourselves, as we showed with the paper. We can spend more time, um, you know, sorry, we can spend more on others than we do ourselves. We can live other-centered lives. We can fight these narcissism tendencies for us just to be only fixed about ourselves. I would ask you the question, are all of your investment choices... So I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about your time, your energy, your commitments. Are all those choices just for you? The second thing 
that we can do to, to, to fight back against this materialism, to not just take it in stride, but say, no, this isn't what we're going to be about as followers of Jesus. The second thing we can do is we can simplify. We can get rid of stuff. We can sell stuff or we can give it to others. We can take steps towards maybe minimal, minimalism. We can minimalize our life a little bit. The question that I would ask for us is all your goals or all your financial goals in your life or all the goals in your life just to get more stuff? Is it just to accumulate things like a trip or a house or a car or stuff? What I'm saying and what I would say Jesus is saying in this passage is it's not enough. That we have to look beyond ourselves to others. That is the way of Jesus. And as we close the third thing that we can do to begin to step away from materialism and actually walk out the ways of Jesus, what I would say is the most important thing is we can put Jesus back on the throne in our life. That we can spend some time with God and say, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry that I've put my hope, I've put my faith, I've put my trust, I've put my everything in stuff or in my credit card or in my online purchases or in my phone or in my relationships. And we can say, God, I'm sorry, God, I know that it's you that I can put my hope and faith in. God, I know it's you that I can trust. we can ask ourselves the question, is Jesus really Lord of your life? Is he everything? Because he needs to be friends. Let's pray. God, God, we thank you for the opportunity to come spend time together as family and to uh, spend time unpacking a couple verses from your word. God, I pray that in this difficult and, and at times sobering teaching where we talk about stuff and, and the culture that we're so wrapped up in, God, I pray that you, would, that you would show us opportunities to step forward. God, you would help us to invest in others. You'd help us to simplify our life. God, you'd help give us a vision that our life can be so much more than just storing up treasures on earth. And God... Above all, I pray that you would help us to put you back on the throne in our lives. I pray that you would help us to trust you. You'd help us to put our hope, our faith, our trust, everything in you, Jesus, because you're the only one that can deliver, that that throne is only fit for you, God. I pray that you would help us 